everyone. I wanted to do a lecture a different way. Um, we're going to use your um, Protestant Reformation guided reading as, and we're going to go through it. I'm going to discuss some of the things um, that are mentioned, and I'm just going through the text. So if you want to have that text out and open, um, you can follow along with me. But I just want to kind of, uh, instead of just reading it, um, kind of put it into words um, so so you can get a sense of um, what the Protestant Reformation was about. And, and the first thing uh, to understand is that people didn't, Martin Luther in particular, didn't just get tired of the church. Um, this was a result of the Renaissance. Um, you have Italy separated from the rest of Europe by the Alps, um, and, and, and you, you've got a lot of passes across the Alps, so you can just travel, and people, when they travel, take more than just their physical stuff. They take their ideas, and so they're going to go from Italy into Northern Europe, um, but you've also got some pretty big rivers, um, the Danube and the Rhone rivers, and, and they're going to provide an easy way to, to go. Again, think uh, water and trade. Um, but, but you've got these ideas, those all of those Renaissance humanist ideas, because that's the thing about, this is humanism. Um, and, and you'd had people who had come to Italy to study it, and they're going to take it back with them. Um, you look, too, at um, the increase in trade uh, and commerce and the new wealth. And, and people can now afford a higher education. They can afford to go to these new universities um, and, and they can afford to study all of this. Um, you also add into that uh, Johann Gutenberg who created that printing press. And, um, you know, books are available and they're cheaper. And it just, everything catches like wildfire, all of these ideas and they spread. But humanism looked different in the North as it did in Italy. It, it not so much that it was different, but it evolved. It, you have new ideas coming into it and that was from the Northern Europeans. Um, so let's look at number one. It says the best known Christian humanist, um, he believed that the ideas of Christianity and of classical civilization could be harmonized. And he wrote The Praise of Folly, in which he helped prepare the way for the Reformation. And this is, and I'm going to type the, um, the answers here, and this is what you would actually write on the back, okay? I'm going to try to make sure it's in a different color so you can see it. Um, this is um, Desiderius um, Erasmus. And uh, he's an interesting guy. Uh, he had entered a monastery, um, but he actually is going to leave so he could study the classics, which ought to tell you something. If you, you know, uh, in a monastery, they studied the Bible. Um, and, and they, I, I guess, they prayed, uh, but, but they didn't really, they weren't allowed to study the classics. And so he's going to leave the monastery so he could study the classics. And he's going to learn about the ideas of the human, um, the Italian humor, uh, humanist. Um, again, those books. Thank you, Johann Gutenberg. Um, and, and here's the thing. He is a Christian humanist. He, he didn't leave the monastery because he didn't believe anymore. Um, he wanted to also look at the classics, Greco-Roman um, work. And so that's kind of what all of this was, this idea that you could, you could harmonize Christianity with the Greco-Roman um, works. And he studied the Bible critically um, by that, I mean, he questioned it. He didn't just accept it. He, he was very critical, um, not so much of what it said, but, but he looked at what it said versus the way the church lived. 
And so um, he is going to criticize not the Bible, but he is going to criticize the church. And he's going to say that they have moved away from the spirituality um, that they had have. And that going back into the Middle Ages, that the scholars had made um, the Christian faith less spiritual, more complicated, a lot of ceremony. Um, and, and it wasn't as simple as it should be. And so that's where um, the praise of folly comes in. He ridiculed, now, and that's important ridicule of the church was not allowed. He ridiculed ignorance and superstition and vice among his fellow Christians. He criticized fasting, pilgrimages to religious shrines, and even the church's interpretation of the Bible. So what you begin to see here is true criticism of the church. Now, the reason we go back into the Renaissance, because we have to understand that that the Reformation doesn't just happen, um, that the Renaissance kind of led to it. And I'm, I'm focusing on those Northern um, humanists in that too. Um, another uh, Northern, uh, Northern European humanist was Thomas More. And um, he was a friend of Erasmus. And uh, by the way, make sure you spell More correctly. Um, but he had some similar views here, okay? Um, also has an interest in the classics, as do most of your um, Renaissance um, people. And he is actually going to write a book called Utopia, in which he condemns governments as corrupt and argues that private ownership of property causes unnecessary conflicts between people. And really, he's going to contrast the life with your, in Europe with uh, his description of an imaginary ideal society. And, and that's pretty much where our word of utopia comes from. It's an ideal place or society. And um, it, it has ideas like equality, at least among men. Um, and the idea of equality wasn't one that really existed in the world. Um, and so it's it's a pretty revolutionary idea. Um, and, and Thomas More is going to uh, his, his work, by the way, became famous throughout Europe. It is written in the vernacular, and it is going to be translated into German, Italian, French, English, Dutch, Spanish. Blah. I mean, he was very, very well known uh, throughout um, Europe. Uh, Henry VIII is going to, um, I, I don't want to say, well, I guess we could say he works for Henry VIII. He's going to serve um, under Henry VIII in England, um, but but he's going to run into some problems with Henry VIII. He's going to refuse to accept his supremacy um, of the Church of England, and so he's going to be executed. Um, and oddly enough, the church that uh, he criticized is going to make him a saint about 400 years later. So just a little bit of interest, interest there. Uh, at least I find it interesting. Um, let's move on to number three. Uh, at this point, we are moving into the section three, the Protestant Reformation. Okay. Um, and, and that's really what number three is. This that the, the answer is Reformation. It is also known as um, this the major goal of this movement was the reform of the Catholic Church. So um, it does lead to a split. Um, in the church in Western Europe, and we'll be looking at that within the next few minutes. Um, causes of the Reformation, um, it, as most things do, it comes down to money. Um, you've got a lot of these people, these, you know, Erasmus and... Um, more, but others too, who who felt like the church was more interested in its income than in saving souls. Um, they felt like popes um, acted as political agents um, or warriors instead of spiritual leaders. Um, there were some priests who did not behave appropriately. Um, they they did not act in a godly manner. They had vices. 
uh, gambling. Uh, some of them, even though they took vows of chastity, had mistresses. Um, and there are a couple of popes in that boat too, but um, they they were not spiritual at all, and there was a lot of misconduct among the priests. Um, and they began to focus, these Northern humanists began to focus on personal faith and spirituality. And again, that's a part of Renaissance thinking because of indiv the individual. So again, keep in mind how all of this is related to that. So your um, first break uh, with this is, is going to take place in what is today Germany. Now, Germany um, at this time was uh, not unified. It, there were about 300 independent states throughout what we know as Germany today. Um, and they'll unify um, in, in the 1800s and the 19th century. But um, before that, you have all of these independent states, and that's going to be important with what we're going to talk about. Um, in Rome, you have Pope Leo X, and he is rebuilding St. Peter's Basilica, and it is expensive. And he's going to send Johann Tetzel to um, this area. Of, uh, in the northern German states to raise money. And what he's going to do is he's going to begin to sell indulgences. And this is something that had existed anyway as a reward for pious deeds, but now what you can do is if you want forgiveness, you can buy it. Uh, so the church was raising a lot of money um, by selling forgiveness, okay? And um, again, this next one is Johann Tetzel, okay? Um, so not everybody was okay with this, okay? Um, not everybody was okay with this um, at all. And particularly the one that we're gonna talk about, number six, the German monk and professor, um, is Martin Luther. Okay. Um, he actually quit law school and entered the monastery because he was looking for salvation. Um, he is in the monastery and he's studying the word and he's going through all of the motions and he's getting no comfort. He's, he's not feeling like his sin is forgiven. He is not feeling like he has been saved. Um, he did everything. He did everything. He, he obeyed every law of the church, but there was no comfort. And so what he's going to begin to do is he's going to really begin to delve deeply um, into the Bible. And he's going to receive a revelation. And this later becomes known as um, Lutheranism, and I think that's one down here, um, number 10. I'll go ahead and, and, and put that down there. This is Lutheranism. Um, but, but he is going to come up with this revolutionary idea. Um, he is going to realize that ceremonies and good deeds are not what save you. Um, the only thing that really counts is faith in God. Um, you can receive salvation only through the grace of God, not by your actions. Now, this if, if you go to church at all, this sounds very similar to what you will hear in church um, because this is still a foundational principle in Protestant churches. Okay? Um, and it's simple. Simple faith could lead to salvation. Um, and this is called justification by grace through faith. It has a name. Okay. Um, Luther is, is actually going to go further than just teaching that teaching this is, is bad enough. But he's going to go further. And, and he's going to, I don't want to say attack, but he's going to put out there a claim, a very public claim that Tetzel um, it was not right to ask people to give up money 
for false prophes- promises of forgiveness. And so he's going to challenge Tetzel with his 95 theses. Okay, and um, these are just 95 statements that he nails to the door. Um, I believe it was in Worms. And, oh, it was, it was bad. It was really bad um, it, because it challenged not just Tetzel, but it challenged the church. And remember, we talked a lot about the printing press. This is going to kind of help that word spread throughout Europe, uh, not just the fact that he did it, um, but also some of the printing presses are going to start printing those 95 theses and they're going to make their way, they're going to blaze their way um, across Europe. And he saw himself as a reformer. He, he didn't want to split the church. He didn't want to leave the church. He wanted to reform the church. So, um, he, but, but really his, his challenges are, are going to lead to the church denouncing him. Um, when you come out and when he said that the Bible was the sole religious authority, <laughs> it's not up to the popes and the bishops and the priests to tell you what to believe. It's, it's in the Bible. And so he, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way of saying this. He basically said that they're not as important. And and these were very powerful, powerful men. The church was so powerful. We talked about that with the Middle Ages, the power of the church. And here is one man, a monk, challenging that. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was huge. Uh, it's like a big explosion going off. Um, he actually, Luther actually believed uh, that the church was a priesthood of all believers. Um, so he is going to, he's going to use that printing press. He's going to take advantage of it. And he's going to spread his ideas and he's going to continue to attack certain church practices and approaches. Um, Pope Leo X is going to declare him a heretic. He's going to be excommunicated from the church. In other words, he's kicked out of the church. Um, and in many ways, he becomes um, an outlaw. He becomes an outlaw. I, I don't know if there's any other way to put that. Um, there were some who were willing to, uh, to kill him for that. Okay, um, so that's number eight. And um, by... It, this is where we are now. So the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, and uh, here um, you see that term Holy Roman Emperor again, kind of go back to uh, Charlemagne. Um, but he is going to have, you know, tell Luther, you need to come uh, to the Imperial Diet. Um, and that's just a special meeting um, in the city of Worms. And this is called the Diet of Worms. Okay, um, and here they are going to decide several things. Uh, the emperor is going to declare Luther an outlaw. He is going to ban the printing and sale of his works. And Martin Luther is going to have to run because he has been declared an outlaw. Of course, he didn't go to the Diet of Worms. Um, but like I told when we talked about the fact that Germany is not unified. You've got 300 uh, German states. Um, the Prince of Saxony, the Elector of Saxony, whose name is Frederick the Wise, is going to protect him. Okay? And um, hide him away until everything could kind of die down. Uh, and, and under this protection, Luther's going to continue to work. He's actually going to um, translate the Bible into German. And this means now that all literate Christians in Germany could read the Bible themselves. Now, literate. But again, because you have the printing press and because you have um, the availability of these books, you're going to begin to see the spread of literacy. Remember, we talked about that as one of the things about um, the Renaissance. So, and y'all know this, 
the more you uh, the more that you um, are attacked by leadership, by government, by those more powerful, the more they attack an idea, the more it spreads. And that's exactly what happens here. Charles V is going to continue to oppose Luther and his teachings. Um, and he's going to do what he can to keep it from spreading. But really, Luther has a lot of support among um, those, ger those German princes. Um, and, and Lutheranism is going to spread. And because of the protest, uh, Luther and, and the later ones after him became known as Protestants. If you look at the uh, root of Protestant, it is protest, and that is what it is about. They were protesting um, Catholicism, okay? Um, he is going to found a new church, and that is the Lutheran church, and it still exists today, okay? Um, he is going to put into practice what he's been teaching, uh, this new church, is very simple, at least compared to um, the Catholic Church. Uh, ministers were less important than the priests had been. And Christians themselves, according to Luther, are very capable of interpreting and understanding scripture for themselves. And, and this is going to come back as, as Protestant, Protestantism spreads. This becomes a huge part of um, the founding of America. Okay, um, so Germans aren't alone. Okay, oh, but I, I missed a whole part of this. Um, no, I'm good. Um, but Germans aren't alone in, in wanting a simpler faith. Okay, um, and so a lot of your German rulers are going to establish uh, Lutheranism, the Lutheran church within their states. Now, this is going to put them against Charles V, and um, initially he can't do much about it because he is fighting the Ottomans, but, but he is finally going to begin to turn his attention to the Protestants in 1546, and he is going to send his armies against the Protestant princes in Germany. So we're entering into a period of religious wars. Um, Martin Luther is actually really appalled by a lot of the war and the um, bloodshed that happens. And he's, at some point, he, a lot of people, he upsets a lot of people when he kind of seems like he backs off from uh, Lutheranism, but, but he's backing off from the war and he's wanting to try to keep the peace. It doesn't really work, but uh, it creates some anger there. We, we're not going to get into that. Um, Charles V and his armies win, but you, you can't defeat the idea. And so what's, what they're going to do is in 1555, they are going to sign the Peace of Augsburg. And it states that um, each German ruler had the right to choose the religion of his state, um, and the people who lived there could accept it or not. But if you didn't accept it, you had to leave. So um, very, um, very simple. Okay. Now that moves us. Uh, it kind of brings us to the point too, to where we we begin to have different sects. Um, S e c t um, s. Uh, Probably, I guess we could consider this the forerunner of a denomination. Um, these sects tended to be very unorganized, more of a society of a few people. Um, they had a preacher for a leader, um, and most died away. Um, some of your stronger ones are going to form into different um, denominations. Okay, um, a different uh, moving away from Germany. Uh, is the split in England because it happens differently. Um, this is a political move here. And uh, Henry VIII is married to Catherine of Aragon and she has birthed a girl and she has not given him the male heir that he needs. Um, there is also a very young and pretty lady in waiting named Anne Boleyn, and he would like to marry her, hoping for this boy. He is going to ask for a divorce 
It is not going to happen. Um, I'm very much simplifying this, okay? I'm very much simplifying this. Um, Clement, the Pope was Clement the Seventh. He is not going to um, help Henry out. And so Henry, because I don't really like the way this is in, in the book. Um, I don't like the way this is. I'm not going to get into it any more in depth. I'm just going to say that Henry was unhappy that he was not um, given what he wanted by the Pope. And so he is going to withdraw England from the Catholic Church. And he is going to create, it is called the Church of England, but its official name is the Anglican Church. Okay, um, Church of England, Anglican. Okay, um, as I said, this was political. He immediately seizes all of the church, Catholic church property. He is going to take their wealth, their gold, and he is going to put it in his treasury. So it's political. This this was not, he, he had actually supported the Catholic church against Protestantism, against the Reformation. Um, but when he didn't get his way, he changes his mind, if, if this makes sense. And, and again, like I said, it's political. And he's going to take a lot of the church property, all of the church property. He's going to take all of the church property. And, and a lot of Catholics are going to be forced underground. Um, it, it, it brings in a time of turmoil, of religious turmoil, uh, to England. And they're actually going to have a, a few wars over, civil wars over this also. Um, here's a few things to note about um, the Anglican Church. Uh, they keep a lot of the Catholic ceremonies. That's why I said this was not... Um, a religious split. This this was a political split. So they're going to keep a lot of those ceremonies um, in there. Um, this is actually too going to pave the way for the Protestant Reformation in England, and and we'll get more into that later. Okay. Um, not dealt with Protestantism in Europe. Heading back, um, and in particular, we're going to look at um, Switzerland. <clears throat> okay. And uh, in, in particular, we're going to look at Zurich. The priest there was Huldrych uh, Zwingli. Oh, I misspelled that. H-U. Okay. And, and he, he's going to introduce some reforms that lead to a split in Christianity in Switzerland. And um, I'm not really going to focus a lot here. Um, he knew Luther. They had discussed things. Um, they, they agreed on a lot of things, but they didn't agree on everything. Um, Zwingli probably was a little, went a little bit further. Uh, he didn't believe in any kind of decoration in the church either, covered up all wall de decorations in their church. Um, and he's actually going to die in a battle between the Protestants and the Catholics. Um, but uh, a French Protestant is going to carry on his um, work. I said French, but he was Swiss also. And that is John Calvin. And John Calvin is going to give us Calvinism. Okay. And probably one of his, and, and this becomes a very popular belief uh, throughout the Protestant community, is the idea of predestination. And this is the idea that at the beginning of time, God had decided who would be saved. Um, those who were predestined or chosen beforehand um, for salvation were called the elect. And they formed a special community um, of people who were expected to follow the highest moral standards. And these standards placed great emphasis on self-discipline. And the individual is expected to be completely dedicated to God's wishes. So I just read to you what predestination was, um, and it is on page 366, um, if you want to go back and look at that. Um, but Again, this idea takes out of the mix the priest, um, 
and, and people based it on a feeling. Uh, I'm not going to get into the theology behind predestination, um, but but it's a, it's an idea that's still around today too. Um, you've got those who who believe in predestination in churches today too. Um, in, in 1536, Calvin is going to move to Geneva, Switzerland, and I, again, am misspelling things today. And it is going to become a, a center of Protestantism. Uh, in fact, it's going to become a theocracy. And um, by a theocracy, I mean it is going to have a religious government. And it is a strict government. And you see... Um, the, uh, it, because of the importance of righteous living, citizens were very strongly regulated. Um, they couldn't play cards. They couldn't dance. They couldn't curse. They couldn't dress um, elaborately. Um, if you broke the laws, there was a lot of punishment involved. Um, the stocks and um, you would think that people would hate this, but but really they they were all on board and the. It, this appealed to them. Now, some of this is going to sound similar to New England with the Protestants who moved there, and we call them uh, the Puritans. And um, they very much had rules like this. And if you think of some of the pu pu punishments, um, next year when you get to English, you will be reading the Scarlet Letter. Um, and that's, a, that's an example. That's a part of this righteous living. So, um, Protestant, excuse me, Protestantism is going to spread further. And it is going to go into um, France. Calvinism in particular is going to spread into France. And the high-ranking nobles who converted to Calvinism were known as Huguenots. Okay. Um, now, France is going to remain Catholic. Um, and France is not a fan of Protestantism. Um, unlike Germany, they do not embrace it. Um, the church is very strong there. Uh, the kings, uh, the, the Bourbons, are, are very ardent uh, supporters of the church. And uh, But you still see some support of Calvinism. About a third, it's thought maybe about a third of your French um, aristocracy um, or nobility had become Calvinist. Now, some of that might also be political and economic. Um, the church was very powerful in France, and so this was a way, possibly, I'm not saying that they did not have real faith, so I'm going to back up on that, but but I think some of that was uh, quite uh, political, but but it was it was also detrimental. Uh, in 1562, um, rather, uh, the Huguenots are going to be attacked, and there there's going to be a series of very bloody civil wars in France uh, with the Catholics. And in 1598, King Henry the Fourth issues the Edict of Nantes, and um, the Edict of Nantes basically gave the Huguenots the freedom to worship and some political rights, some political rights, not a lot of political rights. Um, the reason why you see the Edict of Nantes is, um, believe it or not, Henry IV was a was Huguenot. Um, he did uh, nominally convert to Catholicism, but at heart he was um, a Protestant. And, and so that kind of helps give um, the Huguenots, kind of gave them a little bit of the help that they needed there uh, for some freedom um, of worship. Now, listen, Huguenots also immigrated to America. Um, they came in through Pennsylvania, and then they moved down um, down to South Carolina. Uh, There's a fairly large Huguenot um, population that moved to South Carolina. Uh, there still exists in downtown Charleston a Huguenot church, and probably one of our most famous Huguenot citizens of South Carolina was Francis Marion the Swamp Fox. Um, he was... Um, even then, a Huguenot. Just saying. Um, just to let you know that, that this 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 reflects on U.S. history. Okay. Um, I don't want you to kind of think that 
Protestantism didn't spread further, um, you do have some Calvinist minorities in Poland and Hungary, Eastern Europe. Um, you have a lot of uh, Calvinists in Scotland, Northern Netherlands, um, and, and of course in the German states. But, but really, um, and, and like I said, even in America, because it, it was Puritanism, which was a form of Calvinism, which played a huge role in, in the founding of New England. Uh, and, and we still see a lot of that today, uh, a lot of the influence today. A lot of our early, um, a lot of our early universities taught these ideas, Princeton and Yale, they, they taught these ideas. They were meant to train preachers. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, getting into section four now, this is the Catholic Reformation. And another name for the Catholic Reformation was the Counter Reformation. Okay. Um, and they had some problems. They had some real problems uh, to, to deal with. Uh, finally, finally, the church realized <laughs> Protestantism is a thing and it's a threat to us. Um, Erasmus, even though he was doing it within the church, his criticisms had been, uh, you know, just kind of whatever, ignored. Um, Martin Luther, it's hard to ignore that. But instead of addressing it, his his criticisms, they attacked him. Um, and, and you see the wars, uh, you see the problems. But Protestantism to so many people, particularly in Northern Europe, was so, it, it just made sense. It was so much simpler. And, and, and the Catholic Church was losing people to Protestantism. So as the Protestants gained ground, um, the reformers were finally able to convince the Pope that hey, you need to do something. You need, we need change. And so that's where this counter-reformation comes in at in the 1530s. Um, it's, a, it's an attempt to return the church to an earlier time where they emphasized the spiritual. Um, let's make our doctrines more clear. Um, let's primarily stop the spread of Protestantism. I mean, so there's your three real big reasons there. So emphasizing the spiritual, um, making doctrines more clear and stopping the spread of Protestantism. That's the three points. That's, that's the three purposes of it. Um, Pope Paul um, the third uh, is going to work to revive that spiritual outlook. Um, he is also going to bring the Inquisition to Rome. Now, the Inquisition had been started by the Spanish, um, and, and we know about the Inquisition. I hope these are horrific, horrific punishments, um, crushing feet, um, some of the tools of torture that you could look back and see, Inquisition tools of tor torture. The, these were church this, this was a church torture, uh, and, and that's what's so hard to believe about this. Um, the most extreme, of course, uh, was the burning at the stake. And um, the idea here was burning the sin out, you know, using fire uh, to purify. Um, and, and you have that imagery in the Bible, but uh, they, did, they didn't use it this way in the Bible. Um you know, you can get the, the Inquisition with the dealing with witches and, and sorcery and things like that. But uh, the Inquisition is going to be brought to Rome, and, and it is cruel. Um, now, I will say that the focus was not Protestants. They were not focused on going after Protestants with the Inquisition. They were focused on Catholics. Okay? So it was the idea of, of keeping Catholics within the church. Um, so you also have Pope Paul the Fourth establishing the Index of Forbidden Books, and and these were just books that Catholics were forbidden to read. Now you'll notice um, that it's not a book burning uh, printing press took care of that. Uh, prior to that, because there were so few books, because they're all handwritten, it was easy to go around towns and and burn forbidden books. Not that you had many, just because they're so 
hard to make. Um, but but now it's just uh, easy, easier to just say, okay, you can't read these. So the, you've got your forbidden book list. Um, and then in, um, there's three of these meetings um, that take place, but uh, Pope Paul III knows that we can attack Protestantism, Protestantism all day, all day. But, but we need to be able to attack it with why we're better. And so to do that, we have to make our doctrines more clear. And so I think you have about three different meetings uh, at the Council of Trent. Uh, between 14, 1545 and 1563. And it actually defines the official church position on matters of doctrine. Piece of cake. All right. Um, some of the other things they did is they formed new religious um, orders. And um, probably one of the best well known uh, was the Jesuits. And it was formed by Ignatius de. Loyola. And by the way, we have a Loyola College. Guess what? They're Jesuits. We have quite a few Jesuit um, universities throughout um, the United States, believe it or not. Um, it was the Society of Jesus. That's really what Jesuit means. Um, he, Loyola, believed in salvation could be achieved in part by doing good deeds, um, and his followers took vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience to the Pope. Um, interesting thing about them is it was run like a military order. It was considered a military order by a lot of people, um, strict obedience. Um, but, but really, they become among the most effective agents in spreading Catholicism. Uh, it's Jesuits, a lot of times, French Jesuits, who came to America uh, and settled in places like Quebec and um, throughout uh, the upper Midwest of what's present day United States, but also Canada. Um, also, though, um, they were the missionaries. This was a missionary order. Um, and they went to China and Japan. Um, they were effective. Their, their teaching, their preaching slowed the, the spread of Protestantism in Europe, uh, particularly in France, Germany, and Poland. Uh, but now here's an interesting thing. They did stress education, okay? And, and they founded some of the best colleges in Europe, but again, also in um, the United States. So um, here you begin to see um, the slow, the slowing of the spread of Protestantism, okay? It does not end, but it does slow. Okay, so some results. Okay, um, it does not bring about tolerance. It, it, the, the Reformation does not bring about tolerance and it probably makes it worse. You can see the lack of religious tolerance in America. Um, you can see it in England. You can see it in France. In Germany, um, it, it, there is fighting between Protestants and Catholics, N not just between, well, not just civil wars, but over time, it's going to be wars between other countries. I mean, th this is a, th this was not a small thing. This was a big, huge thing, okay? Um, and, and there was a lot of religious wars in France, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Um, the wars ended in the mid 1600s, um, and, and, and but but again, it, it does not end all of the conflict between the two groups. Um, but what you do see because of the Reformation are a whole lot of new churches, a whole lot of different churches, and and church looks different. Uh, church is changed forever because of that. Um, you do have parts of Europe, parts of the world that remain predominantly um, Catholic, um, Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, the native population of Irish, uh, Ireland, um, are going to, to remain Catholic. France and the Netherlands um, have a lot of Protestants. Um, officially, they stay Catholic, but they, they have a lot of Protestants. In England and, and, and Northern Europe, though, become, uh, you, you begin to see a a state-backed um, Protestant church. In other words, the official religion is, is some form of Protestantism. Um, 
Another strong result of the Reformation was um, interest in education. I talked about those new universities, um, but, but, but it's more than just the fact that we have new universities. It's the fact that we have new universities that are teaching that humanist thought. Um, these are the universities that give us Thomas Jefferson, um, John Adams, um, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, our leading, our America's leading men, our founding fathers, they were a result of the universities that come out of this time period. Um, but again, not tolerance not tolerance. Um, but, but what we also see as a result of the Reformation was an increase in the power of the national governments and a decrease in the power of the Pope. So the church loses power and the state gains power. And our final question here, the name of the powerful office set up within the Catholic Church to root out and, and punish heresy throughout Europe was the Inquisition. Okay, now I have given you the answers. I'm going to go back through and I'm going to let you see it. And that way, if you need to, um, you can pause and copy. And then what you can do on the next page on the back, you can fill this in. Extra credit for filling this in. Okay. All right, and this will be due when you return.